I'm Dr. Oksana Baltarowicz from the Jefferson Ultrasound Research and Education Institute of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia. And I'll be speaking on sonohysterography, usual and unusual findings. Uh, this lecture was prepared in collaboration with Dr. Anna Leftoff from the radiology department at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and many of our images are shared. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, sonohysterography and go through some of the usual and uh, unusual things that we see. Let's review the procedure. Um, the way we do it is we start uh, with a vaginal speculum examination. We find the uterine cervix. We cleanse it with betadine. And then we thread um, a little catheter into the uterus uh, and blow up a little balloon. Not necessarily. We don't have to blow that up. Some people do it just with the straight little kind of catheter. Uh, we prefer to do it actually with the little balloon. I'll address that a little bit later why. Then we would take out the vaginal speculum and put in the ultrasound probe. And then instill slowly a little bit of sterile saline into the cavity, expand the cavity, and provide a nice contrast to see the endometrium. And we get such a picture. This is a beautiful uh, delineation of a smooth, thin endometrium with absolutely no intracavitary masses. The indications uh, for this procedure uh, are to provide a detailed non-invasive evaluation of the endometrium. We do this in women who have abnormal uterine bleeding, whether they're pre- or postmenopausal. Uh, and uh, even the, in women who have had a normal endometrium on transvaginal sonography, Sonohysterography can find some abnormality in about 14% of cases. This was uh, written up uh, in AJR in 2002 where women had symptoms. Transvaginal sonography showed a normal endometrial thickness, but the sonohistogram did actually contribute um, in, uh, to a diagnosis in 14% of cases. Uh, we do it in patients who have endometrial thickening that's unexplained or needs further evaluation. Uh, it can uh, be done in women with infertility uh, and recurrent abortions to see the uh, internal uh, structure of the uh, uterine cavity. Uh, in uterine disorders, uh, congenital disorders or acquired. Uh, when the endometrium is not visualized on transvaginal sonography, somebody has to be able to evaluate it, and this is a a good non-invasive way, uh, or to further evaluate a finding on transvaginal sonography. The contraindications are, of course, pregnancy. We would not want to disturb a pregnancy, and active pelvic infection. We wouldn't want to spread the infection by flushing it backwards through the tubes. So if the patient is in an active state, she should be treated with antibiotics prior to this procedure. A lot of the women are are perimenopausal, postmenopausal, so pregnancy is not an issue. There are relative contraindications, uh, such as present of an intrauterine device, uh, which uh, nowadays uh, it is possible to do this. Although 3D um, sonography is now a very good way to look at these uh, IUDs, so it's really not necessary to introduce saline into the cavity. Um, when there are bilateral tubal occlusions, uh, the fluid usually freely floats into the cul-de-sac. So if the tubes are obstructed, uh, uh, we could introduce more infection that way. Or if you actually seriously think a patient has endometrial carcinoma, then that's not a good idea to introduce fluid because we're afraid of, of transtubal uh, peritoneal dissemination of these uh, cancer cells. That's a theoretical risk. And sometimes we do end up finding endometrial cancers on, uh, by this technique. But if you actually see a large mass and, and, and really think it is, we should not be doing this. So the usual um, finding 
uh, is a thickened endometrium, which has to be explained further. There are a few little cystic areas here. The differential diagnosis here is thickening. Is it polyp? Is it hyperplasia? Or possibly carcinoma? Um, less, much less. It's not suspicious here uh, at all. That's why we do our sonohistogram. Uh, and we delineate a, a solitary large fibroid. We can describe how broad-based connection it is to the uh, endometrium and look for additional polyps. Another patient, postmenopausal with bleeding, endometrium is too thick, thicker uh, than five millimeters, uh, and uh, we're looking to see, is there a polyp in there, hyperplasia possibly, um, carcinoma, and the sonohistogram delineates a, um, ir an irregularly thickened endometrium, no polyps, so this most likely hyperplasia. Uh, another uh, mass that's in the differential is the submucous myoma, which is not uh, uh, always clear how much of it is within the, uh, uh, or how large the submucosal component is. So the sonohistogram delineates that very nicely for us. Now, myomas tend to shadow. They tend to have some areas of shadowing, whereas the polyps tend to be homogeneous and hyperechoic and do not shadow. So here the sonohistogram delineates. There's only one. It shows us the connection, which wall helps the um, gynecologist plan uh, their surgical removal. Here's another um, patient, postmenopausal lady, has some uh, bleeding, and we see uh, a myoma, and we're not sure how much of it is submucosal, how much is intramural. So we introduce a little bit of saline, and we see that the endometrial cavity is clean. There are no, there's no areas of thickening, no polyps, and this is a transmural myoma that does not really protrude into the cavity, so there are no there's no endometrial pathology. Another patient with uh, abnormal uterine bleeding, and uh, sonographically, we're not even sure where the endometrium ends. Is all of this a thickened uh, endometrium when we measure it? Uh, is this uh, adenomyosis? So what's going on? Sonohistography beautifully shows us that the endometrial cavity is here. All of this is adenomyosis involvement of this posterior wall. So why would we do sonohistorography and not just go to biopsy? Well, um, this does not replace the need for tissue sampling. <laughs> so this by no means replaces um, histologic evaluation, so histology is what makes the definitive diagnosis, uh, but uh, this is not replacing that. What we're doing is we're providing a roadmap for the surgeon. We're guiding them where to go for a focal resection uh, in the hopes of decreasing the false negative rate of hysteroscopy, which does exist, uh, and we're picking up other findings. There could be multiple polyps. Uh, what about the patient who has a polyp removed hysteroscopically but continues to bleed and eventually is found to have additional polyps in the cavity. And sometimes there are mixed pathologies, but not just a polyp, polyp with submucosal myoma, polyp with um, uh, uh, some type of um, hyperplasia that's more serious. So uh, information uh, is always helpful for the um, managing the physician. Here's an example of what I mean by hysteroscopic false negative. This lady uh, had a, uh, she, uh, a hof, uh, an office hysteroscopy, uh, she, but continued to bleed. Uh, the hysteroscopy was negative. Subsequently, a sonohistogram was done, and this showed that there was a myoma in here. There probably was some difficulty. This uterus is kind of retroflexed, difficulty getting... Um, to see the entire fundus, and in here was a, a polyp. So we can find multiple abnormalities. Um, this patient had an obvious polyp, but there was a little one 
off on the side. So now the doctor knows, the gynecologist knows that there has to get two polyps out. Here's a patient with a dominant polyp and then a little adjacent one. Here's one with three. A patient with multiple findings. This patient had a diagnosis of complex hyperplasia with atypia and an endometrial polyp. This patient had complex hyperplasia with atypia and associated polyps. All of that has to be, uh, a thorough tissue sampling has to be performed when we see something complicated, complex manifestation like this. This patient had a uh, polyp and a submucous myoma. There's a shadowing from this myoma, and off to the side was a polyp. And, and here's her cavity further away, actually multiple polyps. The typical uh, endometrial polyp is a homogeneous, hyperechoic, smoothly marginated, uh, well-defined mass. And this is obviously seen here on this MP display and on these rendered images. Uh, we can even see it better. Some, some places are now doing only um, 3D uh, evaluation of the uterus and the endometrial cavity without the sonohistogram. Um, some, patient, some places are still doing uh, quite a bit of sonohistorography. So the typical endometrial polyp is a homogeneous, smoothly marginated, hyperechoic, intracavitary, soft tissue mass with um, preferably visualization of a uh, feeding stalk, as we can see in this patient, all three of these. Now here are some unusual polyps that we've seen. Here's a polyp that has um, a little extra bump on it. Here's a little collection of polyps that look like little, little chicks lined up in a row. Here's an elongated polyp. Here's kind of very broad-based uh, looking polyps. Here's a polyp with some cystic changes in it. Polyps that look a little more uh, rectangular or tubular. Um, here's polyps that have different uh, oddly, shaped, uh, oddly shaped ones. Kind of tubular, here's triangular, rounded, uh, elongated, with um, sort of flattened borders. Here's a broad-based one, here's an odd-shaped one, another one that's shaped like a little hammer. So a variety of shapes. Here's some more unusual ones. Cystic center, here's the one with the cystic center, Here's kind of a um, bilobed. Here are several different, one patient with several different types and shapes. And kind of a bilobed uh, shape here. More unusual polyps. When we did the sonohistogram, multiple polyps showed up. Sometimes they look like teeth, like pumpkin teeth, a variety of shapes. Here again, very uh, cap a very patchless kind of a cavity outlining a whole host of variable types of polyps. More unusual polyps, this, this was a 26-year-old with dysfunctional uterine bleeding and uh, pathology showed um, that she had um, multiple polyps and uh, secretory endometrium at, at biopsy. Cystic changes, we have to make note of cystic changes. Tamoxifen polyps often have cystic changes, uh, and these are due to this mucinous metaplasia and atypia that occur. So we would like to have a history uh, from the patient, usually breast cancer history, that she was uh, on a tamoxifen or some type of a serum. A cystic polyp uh, may mimic fluid. This looked like uh, perhaps uh, some fluid in the cavity until we put more fluid in and realized that that was a cystic polyp with atrophic changes. Uh, and sometimes odd things happen, like in this case, uh, the, we blew up the balloon and we did see a polyp but when we pulled the balloon back, we realized that there was a very large polyp, and the balloon was actually blown up inside of this polyp. 
were pushing it aside, and only after we pulled it back did we realize the extent of it. Now, sometimes these uh, polyps come on a long stalk. As we can see here, they can move around, flip around uh, in the endometrial cavity. And also, uh, one little reminder here when we do see uh, endometrial polyps, that on the way out as we exit, we should look for a cervical polyp as well. Uh, here, for example, is a, is a little balloon still blown up. Where After we deflate the balloon, we watch uh, for exit. And here, we see some extra soft tissue within the cervix here. And that was a cervical polyp. So uh, there is an association of cervical polyps with endometrial polyps. Overall, um, in about 27% of patients, uh, we have a there is a cervical polyp of along with endometrial polyps in 40% of postmenopausal women. Uh, and uh, in 40% um, uh, of, uh, and in all postmenopausal women on tamoxifen, they found that they had additional cervical so we, polyps, so we should look for them. Uh, one little technical point would be that uh, watch the pressure on the cervix. Sometimes we press too hard and we can't see the polyp. It's only after we release some of that pressure that we allow a little bit of the fluid to come around the polyp and then we can delineate it. Here we're seeing power Doppler. Sometimes we uh, see unusual things uh, such as a... Uh, polyp attached to a submucous myoma. So here's the hypoechoic sound attenuating myoma uh, and a polyp stuck on top of the myoma. There are um, usual and unusual manifestations of hyperplasia. Typically, hyperplasia is a diffuse, smooth endometrial thickening. Pathologically, they're classified as simple hyperplasia, complex, or atypical hyperplasia. The atypical ones, 23% of them progress to endometrial cancer. So uh, it turns out that we really can't differentiate them from endometrial cancer, so they need to be um, uh, sampled thoroughly. Um, unusual appearances of hyperplasia would be when they are more focal or asymmetrical or irregular in their outlines. And they have, uh, in 26% of cases, they have concomitant polyps. There is polyp or individual formation, uh, and they can have cysts. Uh, and again, would be difficult to differentiate from endometrial cancer. Uh, here's a case of uh, focal thickening uh, in the, of the uh, endometrium. This was hyperplasia. Uh, and it had small little polypoid projections. So this had to be biopsied. It was focal hyperplasia, as we see here. Now, a submucous myoma is typically a hypoechoic solid mass with acoustical shadowing, and it has a broad-based connection uh, to the uh, uterine uh, endometrial wall and has a covering uh, of endometrium on top of it. And here's, here's another one, uh, hypoechoic shadowing kind of a mass. Uh, the atypical myomas are the ones that uh, may not be so obvious where exactly it is connected uh, to the um, wall of the endometrium. Sometimes they develop cystic changes within. This was an unusual one that had a very thick stalk and projected inferiorly, and it had an area of cystic degeneration. It was kind of difficult to figure out how exactly it was positioned. Typically, they um, are fairly smooth, but in some cases, in unusual cases, they have more of a world kind of a pattern. Uh, another atypical kind of case would be when you have the uh, myoma and sitting on top of it is a blood clot. 
another one here with a blood clot on top, causing it to have this kind of a mixed pattern. The Doppler can show us the feeding vessel to the myoma, and then we can, uh, the, the area of the clot um, sitting on top of the fibroid would have no blood flow. Now, uh, other unusual things that we see, we can see various uh, manifest, various formations of, of blood clots, uh, which of course have no blood flow within them. Uh, when we see these kind of um, scraggly looking soft tissue densities, we can try to break them up with the catheter. We push the catheter back and forth, we suck out the clots, we might inject a little bit of the saline to make them uh, help them break up. We use a gentle catheter manipulation uh, and this uh, flushing with saline for moving around blood clots, some kind of mucus or debris or adhesions. We can aspirate the contents and then reinfuse and help break it up. As this happened in this case, this was the balloon and there was this uh, fluffy soft tissue material on top and we flushed um, reinfused, aspirated, and when we pulled back the balloon, the cavity was then clean. So we uh, flushed it out. Uh, this debris uh, may clump up, uh, uh, maybe a little blood clot, uh, and can mimic a polyp. We call these pseudopolyps. Um, and uh, one way to get um, information about this is try this gentle catheter uh, flushing technique. Uh, and uh, in this case, this was completely flushed out, uh, and the cavity underneath it was, was normal. Uh, so uh, good thing to keep in mind. More examples here uh, from uh, Dr. Bonvelez was a case that looked like uh, it might be a mass of some sort, but catheter flushing was able to remove these uh, blood clots, and there was a, a normal cavity underneath all of this. Uh, another example of uh, blood clots, in this case a bit of a retracting clot, uh, flushing technique dislodged um, the blood clot. Another patient here who had a catheter manipulation, there was this small little abnormality here, but when we did the flushing technique, it ended up being like a long, uh, loose adhesion that would whip around inside the endometrial cavity. Uh, changing uh, its position here and there. Uh, and uh, this woman was uh, complaining of uh, inability to become pregnant. And it was thought that uh, possibly this was serving as uh, irritation to the endometrial lining, possibly functioning sort of like an IUD. And there was um, thought about uh, if she doesn't is not able to get pregnant, possibly removing such a uh, an adhesion and seeing if she does get pregnant. Uh, we can delineate uh, adhesions uh, and synechia in the uterus. Now these then um, may move, uh, vibrate a little bit during the flushing technique, but they don't disappear. They stay in place. Uh, they literally are unchanged in position with the catheter manipulation. This can happen after there's been some type of uterine trauma, uh, prior procedures, uh, etc. And these patients uh, may have menstrual abnormalities. They may um, complain of uh, fertility problems and pregnancy losses. Um, here are a couple examples of linear bands uh, and adhesions delineated by fluid. Here's a thick band or a synechia in the uterus that was not changed with the flushing technique Sonohysterography has a sensitivity of 75% and a specificity of 93% with a positive predictive value of 43% for adhesions and synechia in the uterus. Um, the cavity uh, does not distend very well uh, because the adhesion uh, is not allowing the uh, uh, uterine cavity to open up. Uh, sometimes we see thick bands of tissue. Sometimes they're thin, they can be mobile, they can be adherent, they can be actually constricting. Uh, here's an example of um, synechiae uh, that 
slightly moved but did not change at all during the catheter flushing technique. Here's a patient with an area of irregular thickening and band-like adhesions, scarring, a focal area of scarring. She had had a prior um, uh, abortion. Uh, a patient with a postmyomectomy adhesion, a scar that bridges the anterior and posterior wall and does not allow the walls to separate. We can see this after abdominal myomectomy uh, or uh, well, abdominal myomectomy in the sense when the endometrial cavity was inadvertently uh, entered or uh, through hysteroscopic techniques where there has been some injury to the uh, endometrial surface. Um, so in this case, uh, the thickening was kind of nonspecific, but this did not change uh, during cavity distension. Uh, after DNC, we can see these kind of bands. Here again, a scar. Um, to the point where it actually can cause a uterine stenosis. Uh, here's um, fluid within the uh, cavity. Here's the upper cavity. Here's the lower cavity. And this um, scar here, this uh, formed an actual area of stenosis. Now let me prove that to you. Here we're going to do a transverse section through the um, upper part of the cavity, so we see a fairly normal cavity transversely. Then we do a section through this scar area, and we see that the cavity becomes stenotic. And then we do our third section below it, where once again the cavity opens up. So in the middle of the cavity, we have um, a stenosis from adhesions, giving it so-called hourglass appearance. The cesarean section scars um, can be a problem for us. Sometimes they may not allow the catheter to be placed completely uh, into the uh, cavity. Uh, but in those cases, the balloon can be blown up in the cervix, uh, and still we can get the information. This was uh, a sort of a stenotic segment in the lower uterine area secondary to cesarean section scar. We can fill these little niches, C-section niche scars, with fluid. Uh, another patient here where we're filling out quite a deep um, surgical defect. We would like to um, alert the, the gynecologist that the covering is extremely thin uh, and actually can measure it and tell them how much myometrium covers that area. Another patient with... Uh, cesarean section that uh, ended up having a very thin anterior lower uterine segment wall, only a four millimeter thickness that we reported to the gynecologist. This patient uh, had infertility. Uh, she had had a prior myomectomy and was not able to get pregnant afterwards. And when we tried to distend her cavity, it was impossible there were areas of shadowing and adhesions. So we were only able to fill a very small part of the lower uterine segment. A little bit of air escaped into the interstices of the upper cavity, but the whole thing was scarred, and this was an Asherman's um, syndrome, where actually a little bit of that air was helpful to show that little parts could get in, but the cavity itself could not be distended. After myomectomy, sometimes there's a defect in the endometrium, and that can fill out with fluid during sonohysterography, giving this appearance of a myomectomy defect. Occasionally, you will witness um, during a sonohysterogram um, suddenly uh, the appearance of numerous bright reflectors throughout the myometrium. They suddenly come out of nowhere. So as soon as you instill a little bit of saline into the uterus without any kind of a force. Suddenly you have these little micro bubbles of um, air, essentially, that have a lot of reverberations. Um, with our study where we have actually shown myometrial cracks in the uterus occurring with adenomyosis, we think that this is a manifestation of adenomyosis. Let me show you a few more examples. Here was a patient 
who had absolutely no bright reflectors in her wall, as soon as we put the uh, balloon in and instilled, started instilling a little bit of fluid, these little bright reflectors appeared. They were shadowing here, there was, and they increased in number uh, as we um, instilled a little more of this fluid. Here's um, another uterus. Uh, looks like we'll, we're expecting to see some adenomyosis here. The minute we inject a tiny amount of fluid, suddenly a collection of little micro uh, foci of bright reflectors appears, what we think is air that might have been in the um, catheter, uh, and this was absolutely not present uh, prior to the installation of fluid. We have found that these um, that we can actually fill uh, these some of these cystic spaces during the sonohistogram, uh, as happened in this patient. Uh, there was no fluid here, and then we were here's the myometrial crack, and then filling of this space. So in those other cases, we think that the micro air bubbles escape uh, into, through these little tiny cracks into the myometrium. This is another patient that had absolutely no cystic changes, but after filling the cavity, there was um, a fluid filling a little uh, outpouching with a connection with this crack in the myometrium. Uh, the, another uh, example here of a patient with a focal adenomyoma, here, a heterogeneous rounded area, no real mass effect, blood flow throughout the mass. And as we started filling, we have bright reflectors that suddenly occur, and over the course of time, fluid shows up in the wall. So this, it, there must be some little small connection that is allowing this uh, fluid to fill. In some cases, it, it may be impossible uh, to uh, distend the cavity, uh, especially if it's been scarred. Uh, and sometimes it's the air that actually may help you during the sonohistogram. This patient had postmenopausal bleeding, and when we instilled a little bit of fluid, we could not really distend the cavity. But a little bit of air was able to find its way and we were trying to delineate the endometrium, but realized that suddenly this was actually filling uh, a larger area of myometrium, showing little tracts of how this air escaped um, and infiltrated here into the myometrium, proving to us we think that there were connections with the endometrium uh, and uh, infiltration. Uh, with adenomyosis. Now, there was no force applied here absolutely at all. Uh, this patient certainly wouldn't have even allowed that. And we have this distribution of air then throughout the myometrium um, as a sign of adenomyosis, which, by the way, was proven in this case with um, MRI. Congenital anomalies uh, we see. We can introduce fluid. Uh, into the cavity. Here we can see this is in conjunction with 3D uh, from Dr. Anna Leftoff in loaned me these cases uh, where we have fluid filling one horn and not the other horn uh, in this patient with a long septum that separated the two cavities. Another patient where fluid did fill two horns because the septum was incomplete and uh, therefore a subseptate kind of a uterus, which in some cases may have additional pathology, such as a polyp on this one, a couple polyps on this other patient, subseptate uteruses. And here's a sonohistogram with an unusual T-shaped uterus, patient who had been on um, DES, uh, mother was on DES, and patient developed um, a T-shaped uterus and uh, subsequent infertility, uh, another case loaned from Dr. Leftoff. Uh, sonohistorography could help us out with uh, uh, abnormal uh, positions of uh, intrauterine devices. 
uh, here was a case where we did instill a little bit of fluid because it wasn't clear to us what happened with this uh, arm uh, of the uh, IUD. Was it broken? Was it uh, just bent? Turned out that it was just bent and had a little bit of infiltration. Nowadays, um, using 3D sono um, sonography could be a very good way of just doing this without the, the SHG part. Sometimes you'll see unusual endometrial masses. In this case, it was a, a, a soft tissue mass within the cavity, which had a cystic change, and pathology revealed that this was a, a polypoid adenomyoma, which is really focal adenomyosis uh, tissue bulging into the uh, cavity. Here's another patient, another one with an unusual mass. Both of these had a cystic um, change within them, but not, not that that's very specific. And pathology again revealed the polypoid adenomyoma. Another patient with an unusual mass uh, at after surgical removal, this was an adenofibroma. Another case here looks almost kind of like a, a fibroid. Here's a cavity that has uh, little tiny irregularities along the margin of the wall. Uh, biopsy showed that this was a, a unsloughed endometrium related to progestational therapy, and this patient was put on progestin. Uh, so we have a little nodular, uh, irregular uh, endometrial thickening in this patient. Here's another patient that had had some bleeding and sonohistogram showed this little tiny irregularities, which uh, uh, tissue sampling revealed uh, that the biopsy revealed that it was an endometrial polyp with histologic features of uh, progestational therapy, but there was no uh, evidence of malignancy. Now, sometimes uh, we do make the diagnosis of endometrial cancer on a sonohistogram, even though it's not intentional. Uh, this looked just like a thickened endometrium. It looked fairly homogeneous. There was no reason to suspect, really, that there was a cancer. But once a fluid was placed into the cavity, uh, it was uh, found that there was um, a very hypervascular irregular mass. This is from Dr. Scout. Um, showing us here uh, uh, a case of endometrial cancer. Uh, so even though we don't want to do it, occasionally we may end up showing this at sonar hysterography. Postmenopausal bleeding uh, is a presenting sign in 80 to 85 percent of endometrial cancers. And endometrial cancer accounts for only 10 to 20 percent of postmenopausal bleeding. So a lot of things out there are not cancer. Uh, that's why occasionally we will uh, see it on, on the sonohistogram. Most of the time, postmenopausal bleeding uh, is due to atrophy, uh, postmenopausal atrophy, which accounts then for 40 to 50 percent of patients with bleeding, and their cavities are normal. Um, the blood in a cavity that has endometrial cancer can provide sort of a natural sonohistogram. We're not placing any fluid in this cavity. This is just bleeding within the cavity, outlining these soft tissue uh, irregularities. Here's another patient that we uh, attempted to do a sonohistogram, but uh, uh, the cavity was non-distensible. Uh, the little bit of fluid that went in outlined a lot of irregularities, so we immediately stopped the procedure, uh, and uh, uh, biopsy showed that this was cancer. Now, that's one of the benefits of doing a balloon uh, inflation, uh, because you can talk about the cavity distensibility. Another uh, benefit of doing the balloon is with the adenomyosis, because we feel that when we distend the cavity with that little extra pressure, that could open up some of these myometrial cracks uh, and help us show a connection with the uh, endometrium. Uh, but uh, as far as this goes, with a non-distensible cavity, that could be a sign of malignancy. Here's a couple um, more, a few more images of patients with 
a natural sonohistogram, meaning that this uh, fluid is blood outlining these very irregular, lobulated, um, usually hyperechoic uh, masses that is endometrial carcinoma. Again, natural SHGs outlining very irregular, thick tissue uh, in postmenopausal uteri. More samples of endometrial cancers. This was inadvertently, a uh, sonohistogram was done. It's thought to be the, probably a polyp in there. Turns out to be cancer. So atypical sonohistographic findings um, may be seen with unusual polyps, submucous myomas, hyperplasias, uh, debris, blood clots, mucus strands, adhesion, synechiae give us atypical findings. There's a variety of scars, including Asherman syndrome, um, C-section scars. There are unusual appearances of congenital anomalies. Uh, we talked about these adenomyosis tracts that we're uh, picking up that can, we either can fill them with fluid and we believe that we're filling them with some air bubbles. Um, there are unusual endometrial masses that occasionally we can encounter. And at the very end, um, rarely you may encounter inadvertently an endometrial carcinoma. So I thank you for your attention.